All righty, so a little history. One of my recent jobs, Log showed up the first day, found out we had over 80 development teams, a couple million of production users in several different regions, huge application stack, one AWS account. Within a few weeks, it was pretty apparent we were hitting hard limits that Amazon didn't know they had to the point where EC2 just could not give us any more instances. One of my first projects there was splitting that stack from the giant lift and shift that most people do when they come to the cloud into at least prod and non-prod. Let's start there, let's see where we could go. Now we have a few problems. The developers are still slowed the hell down. We can't ensure that there's control over who has access to what because with 20,000 EC2 instances, how do we know who actually has access to those boxes? And how do we get the devs to do best practices? Well, one of the things we, we looked at doing is instead of doing the traditional lift and shift, which they did, was to move this, we're gonna build as an architect. In, in CI CD, development goes from, I push this into to a Git repo, and then it builds to dev, runs some tests, builds to QA. What we, what we brought in was the ability to move your entire environment that way. So now your production release is a whole AMI move. You push the entire stack, all the resources get promoted through it. We now know what's running in prod has been fully tested. There wasn't a, oops, there was a yum update that now there's a new version of PHP in prod than there wasn't in dev or wasn't in QA and tracking down weird bugs that way. We also have another benefit of, we know exactly what's on those boxes. And as we thought about it a little more, we went, we need to split this down more. We need to really bring it, this down because we still have too many resources. Lambda, when it came out, you could only handle 75 gigs of Lambda code. We had two revisions per function and we hit those limits. So now we have to split it again. But we end up with another problem. How do we isolate the workloads? How do we isolate the access? Because our tier one team definitely needs to be able to log into every single one of those boxes, but the developer from application A, they may need SSH access into an EC2 instance in their account, but how do I make sure they're not over in B's account or C's account? We're promoting things. How do we do our base image? How does it go up from there? Where, where does this cluster actually turn into something that's manageable without needing to hire another 50 DevOps guys or ops guys just to try and manage it? We, we tried to bring it to something like this, where you have multiple accounts and adding Azure accounts and Google Cloud, just we have the redundancies, we have data centers close to where our users are. It's all the same issue. How do I manage that access? How do I know what's in this account running in this account is the same release as what's on this account? It's very difficult without the correct tooling. So we wrote some, and it sucked. <laughs> uh, we weren't doing this, uh, as Nathan calls it, it's ride the rockets. We were re-engineering the cloud to try and make it work in people's data centers mindset. In the data center, people look at it and go, okay, I have one firewall here. I put all my blocking on this firewall. Comes to the cloud, it doesn't work that way. You have different defaults between Amazon and Azure and Google Cloud of, if I don't have a security group, what access is it? Some it's wide open. Some it's only what you have open. We also have the issue of when you're running a Redis cluster, why are you running your own Redis cluster, managing that own, 
that underlying resource when you could use it as a service. If you use it as a service, it's always updated. You no, now no longer have to manage it. You now no longer have to worry about the underlying disk space or the hardware or it's got to rotate. Amazon will just rotate it underneath you, migrate the data, and you don't have to worry about that. That frees up my developers. Now, instead of three-month turnarounds from re-release to release, we're finally getting closer to a one-month turnaround. As I was saying, most accounts, they start with this. We've got one account. We just took our data center, popped it. It's a POC. Don't worry about it. We'll fix it later. In my world, POC is prod on completion. That never gets fixed. They just keep tacking shit to it. So, okay, we, we, we now did our couple of POC applications. We're just moving more people in. Now there's new rules. How's the guy on the left know, keep his room safe from the guy on the right? You don't. You start having that weird, this shelf is for me, please don't touch it sticky in the refrigerator. Then someone comes in and you got to start putting rules in, let, let's enforce these. Okay guys, you know, don't put your milk on Bob's shelf. The, he gets really personal about that section, that's where his beer goes. But during that and managing all those little rules, everyone else gets slowed down. Nobody wants to have the time to do that, especially when the rest of the development process is let's do commit to prod right away, right away. Let's, I need to be able to do a hot fix now, not in three weeks. We're looking at doing that with, or you can do that with your whole environment, with your accounts. We end up with this nice multi-tenant where, yeah, it's all a cloud account, but everyone has their own apartment. They can do whatever the hell they want in their apartment, as long as they follow what the landlord says you can only do in this apartment. Once we got that figured out and got people kind of moved in, they realized I wasn't really being a bottleneck anymore. The security guy wasn't stopping them. The ops guys aren't stopping them from doing it, which meant they actually started listening to us. We stopped getting blamed for, well, it worked on my box. It must be something operations is doing. Well, it must be something security is doing because of a policy they put on. No, it, it's still a buffer overflow. Your code still crashes. <laughs> Uh, but it also allowed our developers to do public tutorials. They could follow something, how to do this in Lambda. And they didn't have to worry about trying to find time with an operations guy to get the permissions to figure out what they actually need to create their specific permissions to go in and do that in a the stack. They had an account, they could play with it. Then they come to me and say, We'd like to get these permissions that we've dialed it down. This is exactly what we need. Can we put it into prod for our app to work? Absolutely, let's do that. You just saved three weeks of meetings and emails and people freaking out because I've got a release that's got to go out. It's gone. Now the app teams are their infrastructure team. They're responsible for their software. They're responsible you know, they don't care about the hardware. The network, it's there. When, if it's working, they don't care. They spin up whatever EC2 they, they want that falls within our policies of you could do this, this, or this. Their software runs it. The cloud team is there to teach, is there to help. It's no longer there to be the bodyguard, is saying, no, I've got to hold, keep you from doing that. I, I need to push this button over here. And most companies, that cloud team is eight people for 30 dev teams, 40 dev teams. There's never time for that. Now we were able to work together and we're able to seamlessly go onto Azure, onto Google, and they don't have to worry about it. 
But to do that, we need policies. Because being in security, I don't feel comfortable with just saying, here you go, have an account, I'm not going to check on it again. Let's hope everything stays good next week. So we have some things like, you must have this, S3 buckets, must be encrypted. Except if you're hosting a public website off of it. But, you know, there, there's always these little exceptions. But every enterprise I've worked with has had these things of, you cannot run this version of Oracle, or you just can't run Oracle because we don't want to pay that licensing. Run these other databases in the cloud, no problem. So that's a must. Unless you get your upper level exec to say, you can, the shoulds are stuff, shut things down when you're not using them. Let's, we're going to help you on the way. We're going to give you some of the best practices. But sometimes the best practices that your cloud provider releases don't actually fit your solution. You know, I've had people tell me that, yeah, the best practice is to do this. And it doesn't actually work or we spend more time trying to fix their best practice than if we would have just let someone run it. Because of that, there's always those exceptions. But with the exceptions, you use those to learn. On the op side, they learn from the developers of this is what we're trying to go to next. Oh, this is the new hot language that we're going to do. And the ops guys you traditionally have gone, crap, how do I support that? Now it's the, we could do that, but if you do it slightly this way in your design, we could eliminate all this work from you by we use this other as a service thing. Which turns our requirements are good. We just, at the beginning of the project, say, this option, S3, must do this thing. As long as you check this out, your code review before you can go into production with security and operations and onboarding with the tier one support, five minute call. That's the longest I've had since we've moved into this model. And since most of those have been predefined of this policy does this, we can just breeze right through it and only have to talk about the couple of things that are different. Any of the custom that fall just outside of that line. And because of that, we end up with a whole bunch of tiny accounts, but their blast radiuses are like this big. There is no, great, you, can, you broke into a sandbox account. It's not connected to anything but other sandboxes. Congratulations, you're not getting my corporate secrets. <laughs> you broke into non-prod. Well, okay, now it's connected to the corporate network, maybe. Or is it just connected to only that little section of non-prod because that was some company we acquired and haven't actually rolled it in? You know, we, before, you broke into one box and we had to consider absolutely everything in that account compromised. On the security side, if that happens, now in one of these accounts, we have, you know, 500 boxes, 1,000 boxes to run an audit script against instead of 40,000, 50,000. So, so much more uh, work has been, and time has been saved because the only people that have access to those accounts are the people that need it. So, to pick up where Mike is at, basically, we've got to a place where we've isolated all the different workloads into their own Amazon accounts. And when we say Amazon account, then we mean root accounts. Like, you're in a multi-tenant environment, so basically you're setting up each of those separate accounts on their own, just like they do with separate customers. So we're effectively treating our own internal applications in a model of non-trust, basically. Right? The dream, right, from a security point of view, has always been to isolate our internal apps from each other to create those boundaries of separation like you know, Mike was talking about, so we have that hard blast radius around each one. We don't want a shared SAN that can bring everything down. 
infrastructure change control boards are evil and slow everything down so drastically that if you can start to remove those things by isolating those workloads, you get so much freedom for each of the teams. Right? As he then discussed, we need to then start thinking about policies for how we're going to let them work. If we're letting people have that direct access, what rules are we going to put around them for how they work? So we set policies like S3 must be encrypted. You, know, you can't create networks. You can create EC2 servers, but they must use the appropriate and approved AMI. You can log in, but when, only with SSH keys that are tied back to an act, you know, Active Directory type account. So we set policies or rules for the environment. Now, what's key for those rules is actually you know, to be able to start enforcing them in real time. The fundamental shift we've just made with the change to the cloud, like we're used to DevOps cycling our code through and deploying to servers somewhere, right? But as we went to cloud now, our apps own the infrastructure. The infrastructure has become part of the software, auto scaling, load balancers, Lambda functions, whatever it is you choose to name, those things now are just elements of the software. We can't trust a hardened, you know, infrastructure that we built once anymore and we manage in a back room, right? Yell at people occasionally when they want to request something and put them through a six month procurement cycle. All those traditional things don't happen anymore. We're now in like, I want an S3 bucket for a petabyte a day. It's like, well, just request it. 10 seconds later, it's there. I need 5,000 servers, just do it, right? The key question is, do you have budget? And then from a security point of view, I don't care provided, you know, they are hardened, set up, et cetera. And the key to doing that is putting guardrails around people. So how can I let you have all of that freedom, but within the rules that I really care about? Because there's a whole bunch of rules I used to care about, capacity management, capital, so that's gone. Now I just care that you've got the budget for your department and I can bill you, right? But now the rules are basically, how do I enforce those guardrails on you? And more importantly, I've got to be able to do that in real time. You can now change your infrastructure in real time. The idea of a manual review I'm going to sit down and have a meeting with you to see if you can launch that EC2 server. That is ridiculous, right, in this world. So we have to completely reframe how we thought about those security controls, those compliance controls, those operational behaviors into a world of real-time software. It's not human anymore, it's software. And that's why we need policies. That's why we need separation of those workloads. And that's why we then need to start implementing those rules as software-based guardrails. And so a guardrail really means detecting something's wrong and it's beautiful if we check. That's the classic joke about having a security guard, right, who's paid to say, oh, you're being robbed, right? It doesn't really help unless they go over there and actually stop the, the robbery, right? Detection is only good if you have correction and more to the point in real time, right? Second of all, if you actually do that, you get to a place where you're no longer running around, why are we having 4,000 meetings about how to secure an S3 bucket or an EC2 server and reviewing every project and teaching? It's ridiculous. We've solved that problem a long time ago, and if we can set the right policies with the right guardrails, we know that every single one of those things now and into the future will meet that requirement. Right? So by bringing in those detect correct, those automated rules in real time, we get a massive amount more freedom for those teams. More importantly, we can give them access to the native tools. That learn by doing thing that Mike was talking about, the critical part of that is when a new person joins my team, I don't need to teach them how to use an S3 API. They've done that at their last three jobs at this point. But if I've abstracted all of that into my own concocted internal process, oh yeah, yeah, you can use S3, but you must create this thing, use that policy here, do this form, you know, whatever it is, even if it's like push it through a stack or something, you're still forcing them through a process that's slowing them down, requiring them to work your way. You've broken Google search for them as a developer. You've broken all the patterns they're used to. They can't use open source anymore because they've got to, they only can work the way you work in your org. So you've got to unlock those native tools for them and then tie that up with appropriate guardrails that know how to talk in that language, right? So that's what we mean by being native to those services and tools. Use AWS as AWS. Use Azure as Azure. Use Atlassian as Atlassian. Don't try to abstract them, which just removes value and slows things down. Now, once you've separated all those people, given them those guardrails, created those environments, the other thing we want to do is actually help them, right? So it's beyond you're on your own, which, by the way, most people are high-fiving you down the hallway about, but you want to get to a place where you're actually speeding them up. Not only you can create a bucket, but here's the best way to do it, right? Here's a good three-tier stack that we like in our organization. Here's patterns that you can use at scale across your accounts. Now, you notice the big thing here 
that's different from traditional enterprises. I didn't say, let's create a common service. We don't do that anymore. Clouds do that for us now. Sometimes we might if we've really shown there's a reason why it makes such a difference to our org. But we're no longer saying, I'll create a common enterprise service for you and you'll use me. By the way, you're all now subject to my change control. Right? That's, those are the problems that you start to come into once you do that. Instead, the question is, here's how you can deploy Redis in your account, right? not how you can use mine. Here's how we can run 35 small RDS instances of Oracle rather than one big spanking Oracle in the middle, which is hard to charge back, hard to manage, et cetera. Now I've got schema control problems. So what you want to do now is start to automate out those patterns as guardrails, things accelerate. You create an EC2 server, I'll create a CloudWatch alarm to monitor CPU for you. Right, and tie it back to an alerting system, which means it'll end up in your lap. There's a whole bunch of things we can do to accelerate those teams beyond just securing them. Right? And it's all about having those real-time controls. So what does a guardrail mean? How does it work? So this is an Amazon example. Of course, this would work with Azure, Google, other things as well. But quite simply, it means let's watch what's happening in the environment. So if you create a bucket, we, we should see that straight away. If you launch a server, if you change an IAM rule, we should see all those things straight away. And then we gather those up and move them through a process of dealing with them. By the way, doing this is not easy. <laughs> Every single region of 100 and something accounts, catching all the events, wiring that up, tying it together, making sure nobody breaks it, right? Because if they broke it, your guardrails are broken, so now you're out of control, right? There's a whole bunch of steps you have to do to make that work. Let's assume you get all that going. The next thing you do is, of course, land that in SQS, right? Or something like that where you can handle it. You could write lambdas, but now you'd have to write hundreds and hundreds of lambdas across hundreds and hundreds of accounts, so things get kind of insane that way. But you can do that. What we prefer to do is bring it to a central place. And one of the key reasons is that you really need context about what just happened and decisions about the policy. Oh, you turned off encryption on your bucket. Boop, boop, alarms start going off. But, oh, you're the public website account. OK, no problem. Right? Without that context, I can't make the decisions I need to make for those guardrails right? and subject to the policies. So I need to know who you are, what bucket it was, and then you know, what are the policies in that environment. Right? With those pieces of information, including the event, we can now fire off a guardrail handler right? and take appropriate actions. Turn on encryption, say nothing to do here, whatever we choose is appropriate. Of course, once we fire off that guardrail handler and change something, we create a new event and around we go again. Right, so we have this constant looping of humans injecting change and the system itself injecting change right, to make sure that we're getting to an end state. We want to log all of that just so we know what happened, make security and compliance happy. But more to the point, we need to tell our teams and our developers what just happened because otherwise they see all this stuff going on and they have no idea why did that happen, how was that decision made, how did those guardrails take effect. So the automation is fantastic, but it's critical that you have good visibility out of those guardrails as they flow through. That is definitely something that has caused a lot of meetings of, I'm trying to do this, and it changes on me. I guess now we need to start informing the, uh, the audit trail, because I'll point to you where it's at. Now we got to get to the point where let's make it more visible to the user. How else do, can we do it? Developers don't want that. The hard thing is when you have the automated tool, like your Jenkins job pushes out a new stack. Congratulations. Your automation tool does a bunch of changes to it and then goes, hey, this Jenkins user just did this. I'm going to email him on the changes right. instead of I'm going to email the dev team or found out who pushed that commit for the, the kick off the CI CD pipeline. How do we get to that point? Right. So beyond guardrails, the next thing we want to do is have patterns at scale. We alluded to this before, right? How do I have a repeatable idea of a Redis server? How do I make it easier for you to do these things, right? And more than patterns at scale, one of the things we've found most useful is creating simplified common language. If I can say to you, they're an admin, and you know what an admin means, versus they're read-only or they're a super user, we're in a very high bandwidth conversation now. If I can say that's a private subnet versus a DMZ, and we know exactly what we mean by DMZ, right? And 
we all vaguely know what we mean by DMZ, but in a world of Amazon, well, does that mean direct internet access? Does it mean a NAT gateway? Does it mean public internet gateway? Does it mean public IP addresses? Are we using private endpoints, right? There's actually eight different subnet types you start to want to have in that environment. Creating common language allows you to drastically increase the speed at which you can do those reviews and those assessments, because the only alternative is you end up reviewing a hell of a lot of JSON code right, in a room together, and that doesn't work at scale. The next thing then you want to be able to do is make those patterns move across very quickly. I want an IAM model that's consistent across my accounts. I want networking models that are consistent across my accounts. And by the way, if I improve that model, I'd love to have it automatically fixed across all of that. If I change my default security group, it should change everywhere. Right? These are the sorts of patterns you can do. You don't have to centralize the service because now we're in a world of automation. The fundamental difference is we used to have a physical server, and then one day we realized that virtual machines make a lot of sense. We used to have a physical data center. Now we've got a hell of a lot of virtual data centers, right? which we're automating out at more and more scale for our different apps. Right? Once you get that going, you're now in a world where you're accelerating your application teams with patterns that help them. You're not in a world where you're saying, you must use my service. You must sit in my space. If they don't fit you, they can work on their own anyway. Right? But if they do, you drastically accelerate their speed in the environment. And those patterns also allow the devs to cross things with, hey, this is how we figured out how to use SQS the way that operations and everyone does it. Look in my Git repo. Here's the code to how to do this. My lat one of my previous positions, we had a 60 gig repo of all of the things that the dev teams were able to share of this is how to do the best practice for all these different situations. But again, it was such a large repo, we were breaking things for people trying to clone or doing a push. Because you can't keep that up to date. So patterns, great. If you're going to commit your patterns to a repo or, or share them within your org, slice them up. This is a database repo. These are all the things you need to deal with an RDS instance. This is the repo for EC2 instances. Don't cross-contaminate it. Use that in your stack setup. That way, hey, here's an example three-tier situation. Everyone likes it. It's great. It's groovy. Let's go. But searching for, through some of these really large stacks, it's like searching through those giant, that giant account I was telling you. I found people that had left five years earlier when I was splitting those accounts. Still had active accounts, still had active access keys to all of the things. Yeah. So by common language, this is just an example, right? So if you think about identity and access, I mentioned it before. Try to find ways to simplify those models down to repeatable ways. So if you can come up with a definition like this one, like owner versus a super user versus an admin versus an operator. And you know SQS operator, OK, they're going to do low risk operations in an SQS environment. Right? You can start to do powerful things. If you cross section that with a hierarchy, right, you can do even more powerful things. You can start to say, well, the cloud team has metadata access to everything, which means they can't see any data, but they can see the configuration of those accounts right, throughout. And then you can even go very, very low to give high degrees of access. Dev, you get access at admin level. Prod, you get access at read-only level. Right? There's a whole bunch of models you can start to do with that to really simplify that language. Because the only alternative is to start having very, very complex combinations of custom language in each of your environments, right? which is, is difficult to deal with. One of the fun things you'll find, too, as you scale across clouds is, of course, they each have different ways of handling identity. So AWS is very flat. Every account has IAM, basically, at a global level a bunch of customization. Google, highly hierarchical, right, with inheritance. Azure, half hierarchical, I'd say, right, not at a tenant level, but at a subscription below. So there's different models there that you can start to intersect, right? If you don't have common ways to talk about them, you're going to quickly unravel, and all your conversations are going to get drastically more complex, right? The next lesson we mentioned before with the ability to see what's going on, but this visibility idea is so critical. I mean, we're all used to audit trails. We did them for security and compliance for a long time. Turn on logging, you know, it'll make everybody happy. That's a good thing. But now we really got it. We've got an application that's changing by the minute. Oh, it ran 50 servers for the last hour, and then it dropped to 25, right? 
looks good now, but what was going on last hour? How big was it? Starting to understand how your application is changing its infrastructure in real time becomes something a developer needs, right? They need as much visibility as the audit team did, right? And that also applies to automation starting to affect it. As Mike mentioned before, I created an S3 bucket and the automations encrypted it. What happened? Why was the decision made, right? And how do I see that history for that, in, for that automated infrastructure and that real-time change? Right. So basically, what you end up with then is needing high level visibility to understand what's going on, but then combined with increasingly deep levels of logging so you can really get through and troubleshoot that down. But the idea of just logging it is no longer sufficient. The idea of doing pre-approved changes, I agree that you will use root to temporarily change this network, and I trust that probably that's what you did, right, is not really sufficient in a world of cloud where we actually can do a full git style log of everything that changed or happened right we're in a whole new world of power and visibility there back in my network days we used to use tools just to watch what happened on the switches during the night and i was surprised when i moved over into operations that we didn't have that but then we get into the cloud and up until recently we still didn't have that right so one of the things you know, we happen to do is basically set up, like I said, that git style change control of your infrastructure. If an S3 bucket changes, if an IAM rule changes, whatever, we actually have a diff on that right over time. This is quite fun, actually. What you found recently, all of a sudden, all of the AWS accounts IAM rules change. And we're like, what's going on? Looked in the diff history. Oh, Amazon just changed the limit for the number of groups you're allowed to have from 100 to 300. I don't think that's been announced still, but i will telling you it's true because we've seen it across hundreds of accounts now with a diff to prove the change following out. We would never have known that change had happened in the environment without this type of tooling, right? We're constantly surprised by what's going on underneath us. So after you've done all those things, you've isolated your workloads, you've created your policies, you've got this idea of teams working together to learn and do that stuff, right? Try with experiments under exceptions, come, at, come together, start to get visible into what's going on. You end a place where you can really start to automate it fast and at scale. You're standing on shoulders that allow you to move quicker. You're not stuck in constant review of the basics, right? And you can start to add more and more decisions. It's like capital investment that you keep getting better and faster at the basics. And you better do that when Amazon's adding a thousand new features a year. And by the way, the company also wants Azure or Google chucked in the mix and you're trying to deal with all that. If you're not automating out that core, good luck, right, to keep up. Very, very difficult. So what we've seen is that that ability to automate really allows you to scale. And in particular, we love to hear language from teams like kill the ticket, not close the ticket. I never want to see this ticket again ever in this environment. If I know how to respond to this type of event with an automated response, I should never see this ticket again. It should happen, it should be fixed, and it should be closed, right? And anyone who's worked with level one or two, particularly in a large enterprise where it might be outsourced in different places, if if it can go to level one or two, that basically means you've got a document that says exactly what they're allowed to do and what steps they're going to take if it's done well. Normally, it's not even done that well, but if you've got it to working well. But if you're at the place where an alarm goes off and the question is, oh, you know, maybe out of disk space, right? Clear the temp drive, right? Uh, maybe do this, maybe grow that, check with the application over there. Those steps actually can be completely automated. Right? That's a relatively challenging example, but basically if you get to the point where you're starting to know how you want to respond to those events, level one and two are automations. And everything else needs an application owner's input to be able to do it. So I just hit a point where my operations are automated and everything else goes to the app team. And that sounds a hell of a lot like good DevOps, right? where if you're uncertain what to do, you go back to the development team, otherwise the operation team can work within the constraints they've been given about rebooting or et cetera. But if you can codify those rules, you can automate more and more of it out, right? So you're on the path to getting to that final place. And I found a hidden benefit of that is my devs are on call, <laughs> which means shit gets fixed in a hurry. <laughs> because when things break in the middle of the night, Okay, yeah, I'll just fix it in the morning, look into really what it was, I've got the service back up. Next night, 2 o'clock in the morning, breaks again, guarantee there's going to be commits to that thing being pushed into the build process in the morning. Now, something that was hidden, that tier one was dealing with for years, 
got fixed in two nights because nobody wants to be on call and lose sleep. We want those magical on calls where maybe I get a page at lunch on Friday and go, hey, it's two minutes. Oh, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> right. So when we bring all that together, we, you know, at Turbo, we really think of it as software-defined operations. You've got your software-defined infrastructure. You've got to change your outlook now to a world of software-defined operations. Nothing else will have the speed. Nothing else will deliver the agility that's required for those teams. Right? You have to start thinking of your operations differently. And you end up in a very simple loop, which is basically that your application teams are working directly with their applications on those cloud environments. They're happy. They can do their job. They've got the pieces they need. They can use their tooling. They can Google search results. Right? They've got the native capabilities they wanted. They have the agility. You're no longer stuck between them and the thing they're using, right? As we cloud teams often have been, making the dev teams happy and the cloud teams less in the middle. Um, of course, great power comes great responsibility. Some dev teams are happy, others start to panic, right? What will I do if I don't have to have a project manager arguing with your project manager about the procurement of that server for the next couple of weeks? I'll actually just have to do it in the next two minutes, and now it's all on me to deliver the app, right? There's a lot of, you know, water level reduction, if you want to use a lean method methodology. Yeah, we've seen, our, I've seen several different styles of dev teams. One is the great, get on my way, let me do this. And the other is, but without ops, how will my broken toys go get to fix? Right. Because prod is where our broken toys go to get fixed. Right. And that's where you've got to come back to that teach, don't do. You start doing them quickly, expect you keep doing. Right, and they won't learn, right? So you can start to get to this place. When your app's down, because an availability zone was down, I'm like, well, you had two. You chose to use one. This isn't really an operational problem. This is an application high availability decision gone bad, right? You might want to review that and think about what you're doing next, right? Changes it. Now, the cloud team's job is to help it and teach that application team. Better know the cloud better than them, better know those tools better than them, or at least be able to keep up with them as they're learning it, right? Take those learnings and bring them back and share them with others through automations, right? You're in a world of helping, not request fulfillment. That means you're now standing side by side solving problems, which completely changes the alignment of the organization and the focus. Really hard to explain that until you've felt it and sat there, but there's a big difference between looking across the room and going, when's my server arriving, versus sitting there going, how are we going to get this EC2 server spun up with this thing delivered that we need? Because it's not my job to do it, and it's your, my job to help you do it, right? And now we're in a different type of conversation and interaction. So you end up with a cloud team helping them, and then you've got to feed a lot into automation. Use a tool like a Turbot to accelerate a lot of that automation, right? Or do some of it yourself. But basically, that allows you to start scaling that solution very quickly. If you don't do the automation, you can never keep up, right? And you're stuck going back and forth. And then you end up being the guy that sits there that changes users' passwords on 30 different Amazon accounts because here's your tier one guy, but he right. fat, his password expired when he was on vacation, and now he can't unlock it. Or his, he broke his MFA, and someone has to go into all these accounts and do it. You haven't automated it before. Guess who gets to do it now? Right. So what I was going to do, because this changes now to a world of software, I was just going to take a moment to actually show you what that can look like, this one example. You can, of course, build your own tooling right, to try and do it differently. And I'll highlight a couple of things we spoke about. So a Turbot basically sits inside one of the application, the VPCs or the Amazon accounts of the customer. right? So it's running in their environment. You log in with an Active Directory, so you've immediately got identity hookback. Right? That's a key thing you want, your identity hookback. You separate out all your accounts, whether they're Amazon, Azure, Google, it doesn't matter. You create separate environments. Different developers see different lists of the different accounts. That's the isolation, the workload isolation we spoke about. We're not sitting in one Amazon account anymore. I see my three servers. You see your four servers. I'm not stuck in a world of the most complex tagging scenario you could ever imagine. Right? We just have really simple things. My costs are my costs. Your costs are your costs. Right? That workload isolation with the multi-account is critical right? and can be enabled through your tooling. And most importantly, the ops teams can get access to all of those by giving them their, their user account permissions in one spot. Someone comes or goes, you're new to the team, two minutes later, you have access to everything the rest of the team does. It's no longer this 
three weeks, maybe we got all your access in place. Oh crap, that guy left. Now we're gonna be working all weekend because he rage quit and we have to pull all his access, right. audit all the boxes, all the accounts. Right. Yeah, or if you add a new team with a new Amazon account within the first two minutes, it's deleted all the default VPCs from around the world, set up the you know, IAM policy permissions or password policy, et cetera. You're not worried about that stuff anymore because they're constantly enforced as guardrails, right? Now, after you're in that account, you start to see a couple of different things happen. The first thing is we don't really want developers sitting in that abstraction tool. You want them using their cloud. So you just log, they log straight into the cloud using their permissions. We know who they are through that identity system. These are good things. They are themselves in a native cloud experience, right? They can use APIs, stuff like that. They can, in this case, for example, I have permission to create an S3 bucket. This is basic stuff we're all used to, right? Or if not, you should definitely get into it. So we create a bucket. I'm doing a lot of too hard clicking here um, in that environment. Now, notice I didn't go to a form. I didn't go to an abstracted tool. I'm using the tooling I'm used to. Um, these are dumb, obvious things, but these are critical as you think about and design solutions for your teams at scale, right? Otherwise, you're going to have to teach them and support their basic ability to do these things. So I created myself you know, that new bucket, LASCON2. Now, what's cool about that when I did that is in the background, we've already detected it and fixed everything. So Turbot detected the new bucket and went, oh, versioning's not on. Policy requires versioning to be on, turned on versioning. Server access logging wasn't enabled, now it is. Right? So it's actually detected that, and the guardrails have acted in real time to give the configuration you want. Oh, we need tagging to do the cost center and stuff. It's all just automatically implemented. You can start to get all those sorts of automations happening so people aren't burdened with all of this junk anymore and you're not running 45 reports on all the S3 buckets. It's just done, right? Policies and permissions. Oh, the bucket policy, will, our policy required encryption at rest and encryption in transit. Those things are enabled immediately on that bucket. And this is the thing my devs love, love because they don't have to tra uh, track down the latest JSON of what our policy is. They're, they could just use AWS S3 make bucket bucket name. Done. It's ready for the application. It's not, how do I find all this other thing? Oh, I've been using this script that pulled this from this Git repo, but that hadn't been updated or someone broke that somewhere. It's gone. Now to get to the visibility piece, Tobos detected that we made those changes and it's recorded those straight away. So we just created LASCON2 bucket so Turbot knows that Nathan created that bucket and it'll pull up that history here. Just give me one second. And then basically it also knows that it updated it and made changes to that bucket in real time. Live demos. There we go. So basically we created a bucket, it tied it back to the account, knows it was me, and then it also knows what it changed. Oh, it added logging, it updated the policies, it added the tags, et cetera. This is the visibility we're talking about where people now know what's going on in that environment and they can see that history. In addition, we can see in the history the full activity. We can see we created a bucket. Oh, tags aren't correct. We opened an alarm, right? We checked other things like whether the name was correct, version was on. So we opened a bunch of alarms and then we automatically corrected them, right? And then we automatically closed all the alarms. So this is a world where you're in true ops now in real time, right? Where you create an alarm, you fixed it within seconds, right? You notice all these things happen in the same minute, right? If I dive into one of these, like for example, the tagging, we can see the history of what happened. The alarm was opened, the tags were closed, right? And then it you know, closed the alarm. So we have that history of everything going on in that scenario. That visibility is critical to those teams. In addition, when you want to troubleshoot, you can really go down and see here's the event that led to it and all that stuff, right? Again, this is one example, but what's critical here is that your teams know what's going on, they can understand why, and they can see all of that. This isn't security and compliance auditing anymore. This is change history in real-time automation that your devs require, right, when you're working with them in that way. And uh, on the security side, it could also be a heads up, because if someone just starts spinning stuff up in a new region, all of a sudden, my sim is pulling these logs and saying, hey, normally you're in these five regions. What the hell are you doing in AP Southeast 2? Right. I'm going to flag this anomaly. Someone go check on it. Pick up the phone, call the guy who's tagged on the account, and he's, oh, yeah, we're starting the POC build for this right. to see what the latency is. I never would have known that beforehand. 
So now I know all my other tools are getting ready to start showing this. My other teams are going to start looking at doing this. I need to inform the network team that there's going to be a whole new set of traffic coming in. But we now know instead of the, hey, we're release, releasing in Australia tomorrow, I need you to approve all this and do this emergency change. Right. Even better than that is you can actually set what's the approved regions. Right? And if they create a bucket outside that region, it's deleted within seconds and nope. Right? If it was a more than half an hour old, of course, you don't delete it. You just relieve an alarm, right? Because you have rules about how to automate those decisions that you'd normally do with humans, right? So you can start to do that stuff. Now, from a controls point of view, you end up with a summary then of the status of this bucket. Is it up to date from the CMDB? Does it have a good name? Is logging on, et cetera? You can see the status of it. And all of that is subject to the policies we were talking about. The controls are like the guardrails, the policies are the rules, right? So we can set rules here, like for example, well, I don't, this bucket is exempt from the encryption at rest rule because it's used for public stuff, so we set that rule to be none. Temporaries, all that sort of stuff, because this is a world of exceptions, right? But we just create that exception. Now, what's awesome about this is if you do the right tooling, you need to be able to see where your exceptions are. So if we go up here as a security team, I can see every exception to the S3 encryption rule in my entire environment in one place, right? So as you start to build those exceptions to those automations, make sure you think about how to give visibility to those teams across those different parts, right? What's even better, though, is once I change that rule, if I just refresh, we'll see that in the background it automatically changed the policy, right? So I didn't have to think about any of the JSON or change any of that. The policy is able to handle those things for me, right? So just to close a couple, couple of other quick things. So basically, if we go to that account, the other thing we talked about was having patterns. So one sample of patterns we mentioned was the permissioning. So when you think about permissions, you can start to simplify them down. So DynamoDB, admin, owner, metadata, right? S3, admin, metadata, like common language makes this much easier to understand, right? To be able to grant and handle in that environment. You can simplify this stuff down if you do the right balance on those things. Right. And you could abstract it down to the OS level, the database level, where now you're still using those same patterns, but right. everyone in the uh, tier one team now can SSH into those boxes. Right. Period. From a visibility point of view, give some thought to things like search. So for example, what's all the LASCON stuff in the environment? We can see there we've got like two S3 buckets and an account calls that. That allows you to search by IP, stuff like that, so you can get straight through troubleshooting to the issues you care about quickly, right? And the last thing, you know, as you build automation tools, those dev teams need to automate the automation, right? So that they can set policies that they're allowed to set, so they can set things with their apps. So make sure you're thinking about an API to your own automation and stuff like that, right, at scale. Because otherwise those dev teams are going to be coming to you all the time and saying, well, how do I do this and I need this human post policy change at the same time as this, right? So it's a, you know, you've got to think about that sort of visibility automation of the automation pieces. And where your notifications are going to go. Yeah. How this team over here wants to be notified is completely different on how that team wants to be notified. Right. Because those guys may be Slack power users. These guys may be hip chat. Those guys want a phone call. Well, how do you manage that? How, and how do you allow them to set the, that stuff? How do you know who to contact? Right. Well, now you have to have tags on the account. Right. Do all those tags need to go down in the instances? No. But they need to be available when I need to make a phone call. Yeah. So to summarize, basically what you're looking at is an activity system. We use a very fancy Michael, Michael Porter type strategy idea. Right? Really. You're combining things. By isolating our workloads, we can ride the different rockets that we have available. We can give teams more access. We can then learn with them by creating policy exceptions. There's a whole bunch of pieces here that tie together, building an incredibly agile whole. But if you start to undo parts of this and go, well, no visibility, automation's much, much harder to use. Well, I can't isolate workloads. I'm like, well, how are you going to do self-service, right? You, so there's a bunch of pieces that interact, and you need to think about your architecture a little bit holistically as you tie those together. But once you do that, you get the ability to move at that speed of cloud. You've got those common patterns. You're nailing your security and compliance story because it's automated in real time. You've got cost control by separating out all those different teams. And now your teams are using the optimal skills. They're not lost in the weeds of the basics. 
they're not learning your stuff, they're using the standard cloud capabilities. And that really aligns them up with the cloud team and lets you move a lot of agility. Right? So that software-defined operations really unlocks that software-defined infrastructure in a different way. And any questions? Uh, this seems, um, from, from what I'm seeing at my, my work, that this is uh, more of like a developer ops, like you're saying. So is there, what's, what's like the, the pushback you get with the actual current ops team? Do they feel like they're going to be refactorized? Like, are they, are they scared that the development, development side is making their own pipeline, essentially? And are they, are they scared? Because I'm seeing it. I'm from. <laughs> In my environment, it was the better ones weren't because they went, this helps me do my job. I can move faster. I can now fix all of these things instead of having to yell at these guys that it's not working. The guys that were just kind of coasting, well, most of them are no longer with the company, but they freaked out because all of a sudden, we're making them actually do work. We're making them talk with the developers to find out what's going on and not just give them the finger and tell them no. No, you can't do that. Why not? That's standard. Everyone else agrees that's standard. I don't want to be in meetings all day to find out, yes, we're going to be doing it anyway. It's weird with like, the development people are partly going to have something going back up to where traditionally the ops team was handing them their Exactly. There's a fundamental power shift, right, which is difficult to handle. Infrastructure had a lot of power. They owned the CapEx, right, and then and they, they owned command and capacity. The power now is shifting more to the application teams, right? So there is definitely, you know, challenges of how you think about that as an organization. I think Mike's right in terms of some people rise to that, others shrink away, right? But what's exciting about it is that as an ops person, there's never been a more interesting time to be alive. I mean, like you're sitting there now and asking, well, how am I going to use these 100 services? I used to use databases and Linux servers, probably Windows with an image we developed six years ago, right? And <laughs> now I'm like SQSQs, this, that. I mean, architecture, pattern things, and I'm helping this team. And that's a highly dynamic place to be if you want to go there. If you don't want to go there, then often it's better to keep looking after the other stuff, right, for a while. Well, and one of the things that I neglected to point out earlier is once you pass a threshold of like 15 accounts, this kind of stuff is crucial. You will never manage it when you get six, 700 accounts under, underneath you. There's just no way, f unless you have some intern whose goal it is just to manage access. And if they, I could find that person that I could pay 30 grand a year to just manage access to everything, I've got my unicorn, man. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so with central services such as this and AWS organizations, how do you test Canary and verify any changes that you're going to make before you press the button in the central service and um, make sure that everything doesn't fall over all at once? Yeah, so it's a, fun, it's a fun question, right, and not easy to do. So there's a couple of approaches. One is basically to make sure that you're separating your policies by account environment so you can start to set rules and only enforce the rules you want to do in that environment before you move it to the other environment. We think of that as resource groups. I didn't talk about them today, but basically a way to have policy sets that apply at points in the hierarchy that allows you to test policy sets in that area and then move it to another area more completely. In terms of a basic upgrade of a central service, right? one of the other things you have to do there is accept one thing. This central service is critical to providing access and providing guardrails, but it's actually not critical to the ongoing operation of the tools I'm using. Yes, it has great power, so it could, in theory, blow things up, right, if it did the wrong rule at the wrong time, yes, right. But basically, at the end of the day, it's really controlling access and things around it rather than sitting in the core operational capability of that service, right. They are running directly on their own and it's sitting to the side and managing them, right. So worst case, it's more like a fat fingering than it is like a, it brought the whole thing down at once, right. 
that's not a complete answer. There's a big discussion there. But it's about, you know, you try to do gradual rollout. You try to do that. The other thing, of course, we do is have customers run dev environments of the central service to test some things there separate from the prod one. Right? And often we'll separate. We work with a lot of pharmaceutical companies, for example. They want slow change. We'll separate that out in a completely different version of the environment. Any other questions? If so, find me in the hallway. Yeah. Okay, Great. let's get a round of applause for Michael and Nathan. Thank you, sir.